Okay, so I think that we might be live. Welcome everyone. I, we're just going to wait a few seconds just to make sure that everything is going live on Facebook as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, so I think we'll we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to everyone joining us. Uh, my name is Christina and I am a social worker at Epilepsy Toronto. And I hope that you and all of your loved ones are remaining healthy and safe during these very challenging times. Epilepsy Toronto continues to be committed to supporting you and your loved ones. And we encourage you to reach out should there be anything that we can provide uh, for you or your family. We recommend that you check out our, uh, our weekly online uh, webinars and, and activities that we have going on. We have Mindful Mondays every Monday at 3 p.m. Uh, and we have our Feel Good Fridays as well. Um, if you have children, we recommend that you check out Live with Lily every Thursday at 11. Um, so over the last few weeks, we've received a number of questions about medication shortages and drug interactions amid COVID-19. We thought it was important to offer this webinar as a forum for you to ask your questions and receive the most up-to-date information. We are so happy and privileged today to be joined by Dr. Edward Berkovich, an epileptologist at Toronto Western Hospital uh, and South Ontario Epilepsy Clinic. And we are also just waiting on uh, clinical pharmacist, Laura Wang, who works in neurology at SickKids. Uh, and we're hope hopefully that she will be joining us today, but we know uh, that the hospital is so busy at this time. So just some housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, we will be moderating the comment section of this video, and should you have any questions, please feel free to type them below. We want to make this webinar as helpful as possible, and we just ask that you try to keep your questions general and not specific to you or your loved one's care. And finally, if you have questions that are not about medication, uh, you can definitely add them to the comment section uh, in our previous webinars if those are appropriate, or you can email us directly and we will try our best to get you an answer. So I just want to welcome Dr. Berkovici, uh, and it looks like Laura is here with us as well. Hi there. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Laura. All right, so I think, so we are live right now and uh, Dr. Berkovici was hoping that you could kind of just start us off and talk a little bit about. Um, all right, so thank you very much for having yeah. Toronto and uh, it's nice meeting you all uh, on the Facebook community. Uh, I wanted to uh, first just uh, obviously go over uh, all the questions and answers that you will ha have over the, the, uh, the next little while, but I wanted to sort of give a brief overview um, as a neurologist uh, and as a doctor, obviously these are unprecedented times. Uh, this is something like that we haven't seen uh, even during the SARS time. And obviously this is very difficult for everybody, both being a patient, a, a parent, a, a child. Uh, and so whatever role you're taking, this is obviously very challenging. So I hope that you're trying to stay safe and keep well. This is time to try and take care of each other and take care of ourselves, uh, both uh, when we're uh, in, in our roles, in our various roles. Um, as uh, a neurologist, uh, what we're trying to do in our clinic is still trying to make sure we still get to our patients. Uh, so we're still uh, running virtually uh, as much as we can. Um, sometimes we have to bring patients in uh, if it's urgent. Um, sometimes we have to do some urgent EEGs if it's truly urgent. Uh, and we have to still see patients um, and we're trying our best. And I think that if you are uh, a patient and you have a neurologist and you need to see them, try to reach out to make sure you're still seeing your doctor. Um, we do not want to make sure that you're, um, you're missing out on, on, on the care that needs. Uh, so as we've had some patients just cancel and say, well, I'll wait till I see you and next time. Well, we're not sure when we'll be able to physically pay, bring patients in. So we'll try our best to basically see patients through that. That said, um, uh, obviously, make sure you update you, you see your doctor. Uh, and also, when we are uh, talking about uh, the emergency room and and those and the urgent things like urgent care centers, I think it's important to make sure that you know you don't avoid things just because of the fact that we are uh, we're worried about what's going to happen. I think that we want to make sure um, uh, that we are uh, also taking care of ourselves. So if God forbid something happens, we wanna make sure that we can actually still see uh, a doctor emergently if needed. I know that was a question I had the other day from a patient. Uh, and so I wanna make sure that we're not missing out on getting that care. 
So um, that said, uh, I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion about medications, uh, and we'll talk a bit about that. So I'm not going to play a point because I know we have the, the whole team here talking about the medications. Um, but I just wanted to sort of touch base about those general things. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Christina. Great. Thank you so much. And I think that those are really important recommendations that people continue to see their neurologists and, and make those appointments. Um, so I think we're going to we're going to move into the question and answer period um, of this webinar. Uh, we're going to start with some of the general questions that we've received uh, from clients over the last few weeks, and then we're hoping to move into the uh, Q&A uh, section live. So please, uh, please, please ask your questions in the comments section below. So the first question uh, that I have, and maybe uh, Laura, I can direct this one to you. Um, are there any drug shortages currently and do you foresee any issues with access to medication? So oh, hi, can, can everyone hear me? Yes. I was having computer problems yeah, earlier, okay, great. So um, with regards to drug shortages, I know this is obviously quite concerning to a lot of patients, especially in the epilepsy population where having that continued access to drugs is so important. To the best of our knowledge, at this point in time, there are no drug shortages affecting um, the commonly used anti-epileptic drugs. That said, this is obviously continuing evolving situation. A lot of the shortages that you might be reading about in the news do tend to affect intravenous medications, mostly sedatives, pain medications, muscle relaxing agents that are used a lot in um, the inpatient, in hospital care of patients with COVID in the ICU. So you might be hearing a lot about drug shortages and those tend to be the ones that are affected the most right now. And we are starting to see that in our hospitals. We're doing our best to ration them and use them um, in a judicious manner. But to the best of my knowledge, outpatient medications used um, to control epilepsy are at this point in time not yet affected um, by COVID per se. However, you may be noticing if you're going for refills at your pharmacies that you're only a, now getting a 30 day supply of medications. And really this is a, a, a preemptive measure to try and ensure that we continue to have um, adequate supplies of medications moving forward. Um, there, there might be a shortage on the horizon, whether it's due to increased usage of these agents in the treatment of COVID or disruptions to supply chains around the globe because of COVID. And so it hasn't happened yet, um, but it might happen. And so that's why these preemptive measures are being taken to try and ensure that we continue to have a good drug supply. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so our next question is, what should I do if my pharmacy has a delay in receiving a shipment of my medication? Okay, I wonder so, if, if each of you, yeah, could speak to that from your different perspectives. Okay, so maybe I'll just kind of start from the pharmacy side. Um, in general, we are advising that patients try to be a little bit more proactive in um, in sort of contacting the pharmacy for refills, um, especially for seizure medications, as, as you know, because it's so important to continue with that therapy without any delay or disruption. Um, pharmacies are overwhelmed right now. Um, and whereas in the past, perhaps a pharmacist might have proactively reached out to remind you, call you or remind the, the physician for um, authorizing refills or for, for patients to pick up their refills. Um, these are unprecedented times with the volumes that we're seeing. And so um, I, I do encourage all families to be proactive about um, calling their pharmacies for refills. According to the Ontario College of Pharmacists, they, uh, pharmacies are allowed to dispense up to 10 days ahead of time um, for refill. So for, for example, if you have um, a refill due normally, say at the end of the month, the, pharmacist, the pharmacy can dispense that 10 days ahead of time. Um, now, if the pharmacy is having delays with getting a shipment of medication in, pharmacies will try their best to try to um, either see if the patient, try to see if another pharmacy can lend them um, a supply of that medication or can't reach out to the prescriber to see if perhaps this patient can be switched to a, another appropriate agent. But I do encourage um, patients and families to be a bit more proactive in reaching out to their pharmacies and pharmacies are, are allowed to dispense up to 10 days in advance of the usual refill dates. That's great, thank you. And Dr. Berkovich, um, is there anything that clients should, should they be reaching out to the neurologists if they're experiencing any um, delays in, in accessing medication? 
So th that's a very good question. And thank you, Laura, for, for, point for summarizing that. Um, uh, I wanted to sort of highlight the fact that some medications uh, obviously are, uh, do need a little more time. So it's certain medications that are uh, harder to get, especially if you live in a more remote area. Um, I've been told by some of the companies that there is no so uh, shortages, for especially some of the newer medications. Um, the challenge um, is a fewfold, just seen from a neurologist's point of view. And obviously, the, the, the mindful, not just of the hours of the pharmacist, the hours of the doctor, because if we're not physically there and we're getting refill authorizations, and if I'm only checking my faxes every once in a while, then obviously it's going to be more difficult. So we have to make sure that we don't want last minute refill authorizations on a Friday evening, which never really always happens. Um, so we want to make sure that we can get to these things in time. Be mindful also with uh, certain medications that are what we call controlled substances. So phenobarbital, benzodiazepines like clonazepam, those medications uh, often have a certain amount of time that can be released uh, because of that. Now, sometimes when I've done two month supplies, um, I would have said you can refill it, for example, every 50 days. So that way the person has a bit of time. So they don't have to wait till that 60th day. Now with the 30 day supply, obviously that has to be adjusted. So just make sure that your doctor can adjust that or your pharmacy can ask them to adjust for it. So you don't have to rush only that last day, especially if the pharmacy is closed that day or something like that. Um, I, I would be wary of, of changing medications. I know I've had this uh, back in when Clobazam was, was unbackordered and people want to ask to change to clonazepam. Um, I would just say, I, I understand that obviously everybody has, everybody's busy and you know, we all have shortened hours and extra workload, but really to try and find, if you can't, if your pharmacy can't find the drug, really to call around and see if you can get that because there is also the harm of changing medication. And we, you know, if you're, want to change medication well there's it, you're on that medication for a reason so it's not like it's not like you're changing from advil to Tylenol, you know so some of these things are very harmful and so especially if they require blood work or if they have higher risk of rash um, then that puts the patient more at risk so i think that i want to make sure that i can uh, provide that. So if you can call around, you can just find that medication. And sometimes the, it unfortunately may be up to the patient or the family to call around uh, because sometimes the, the pharmacy would ask me to say, well, where can the patient get it from? And I'm not, I don't know. I don't work with, with pharmacies per se. So I, I, you know, I give the patient the prescriptions. I'm happy to send a prescription or wherever, but I need, you know, someone to find, tell me where to go. Um, so I think just being mindful of that, uh, certain medications, again, are not that easily uh, transferable between one and the other, unless they're obviously a different brand of that medication. Um, but I think without going into specifics, again, if you're someone's on Tegretol and they're going to be switched to Lamotrigine, there are risks with that. And I think we have to be mindful of that, that it's not going to be that straightforward. Thank you so much to both of you for that. Um, and I think in terms of just talking about uh, delays with medication or um, accessing medication, with the 30 day kind of limit that's in place, how far in advance should clients be um, ordering their medications at the pharmacy? Um, so as I alluded to, they can request, so I mean, if it's a new prescription, they should give it to the pharmacy right away, obviously. If it, if it is a refill, um, like I said, they pharmacies are allowed to um, fill refills up to 10 days before the patient runs out. So that's kind of, we don't really want patients to go, you know, a week after they just got their one month supply to, go, to get their next month supply, because then you do run into the um, situations where, you know, they end up taking more, med they have, they end up hoarding more medication than, than they really need. And then that could create issues down the line for other patients who need these medications. So really, again, no more than 10 days before their refill date. Um, and speaking with a lot of my colleagues in, in the community, that's kind of a good balance of making sure that they're proactively reaching out to their pharmacies, but um, also to make sure that there is enough medication um, uh, for everyone. And I, I did want to, um, to, to, the, to Dr. Berkovici's point, yes, the, the switching to a different agent would be the absolute last, sort of the last resort um, in these situations. Um, we, we do wanna make sure that if their own, their usual pharmacy doesn't carry their medication, that that pharmacy will usually try to call around to see if other pharmacies carry it. Again, given the increased workloads, it might fall to the family to do that, to call around. Different pharmacies um, have different wholesalers. And so one pharmacy might not be able to get a drug, but other pharmacies might. And so for example, if you, if you normally go to a shoppers, I'm not just, I'm just 
I'm not picking on shoppers. I'm just as, as an example, if you normally go to a shoppers and they're, they are out of um, valproic acid, uh, um, you might try calling a, a Rexall or a Pharmasave or a Costco pharmacy. Just try other, um, other chains because different pharmacies have different wholesale distributors and that might affect the availability of certain medications. But again, no more than 10 days before your refill date um, is what I would recommend. Thank you. Uh, so now moving into um, more questions around like medications and COVID uh, specifically. Uh, one question that we've been getting asked is if you recommend using Tylenol or Advil um, if uh, someone or if their child uh, has a fever or, or symptoms of COVID. Uh, so I am aware that I think sometime last month, the WHO had initially put out a statement that said for fever or pain related to COVID to use Tylenol and avoid Advil. And then very soon thereafter, that statement was actually retracted. Um, and, ever, and since then, there have been a number of governing bodies, including the Canadian Pediatric Society that have gone and taken a really um, hard look at the evidence. Um, and they have come out with statements that said, there is no evidence at this time that ibuprofen or Advil is harmful in COVID um, or that one or the other, Tylenol or Advil, that one or the other is better or worse. And so there's currently no evidence um, that Advil should be avoided. Um, it is important though, however, that you always follow the proper dosing instructions for either medication, um, which is something you should definitely speak to your pharmacist um, and correctly read the label of that. But currently there, the latest evidence is that there is no evidence to, to show that Advil cannot be safely used in COVID. Great, thank you. And um, are there other over-the-counter drugs that uh, people should be using or should not be using if they have symptoms of COVID? So I work at Sick Kids Hospital, and so I can really only speak sort of to the pediatric side of things. But um, in general, one thing that regardless of whether or not COVID is suspected or not, that we always um, try to tell all of our patients or all of our pediatric patients is that cough and cold medications have been deemed unsafe to use in children under six years of age. Health Canada has put out the statement many years ago. Um, and that's because the evidence shows that there's much greater potential for harm than good for using cough and cold medications in young children. And even up to 12 years of age, um, cough and cold medications should really be used sparingly. And so, and this is advice that I would give regardless of whether or not COVID was going around, um, that in general, um, for that, for, for children, especially young children, that cough and cold medic, over the counter cough and cold medications really shouldn't be given. Um, really, we should be looking more for um, what we call non, non pharmacologic or non um, drug ways, means of, um, uh, treating the symptoms of cough and colds, you know, including uh, warm mist or cool mist humidifiers, drinking lots of warm water um, in children one year and up, drinking water with some honey to soothe uh, to soothe the throat for coughs. Those are the things that we would recommend uh, rather than an over-the-counter cough and cold medication. Um, I don't know if Dr. Berkovich wanted to comment on the adult population. I mean, there's no indications for, for stopping stuff in adults, like not using cough and cold medication. But I think for us, I mean, it's just obviously symptomatic treatment, but to really be mindful of how the person is doing, because if they're having COVID symptoms they, and they need to be assessed, like for, uh, for something like a respiratory problem, then they may need to go to an assessment center or to if they need to go to urgent care because they're having difficulty with breathing or those kind of things, not to be not to try and mask that with over-the-counter medications in lieu of getting medical treatment. So I think that's the, the key thing. I know as I mentioned in my initial part was, you know, we still need to get our medical care. So we shouldn't be avoiding that or, or trying to mask that with over-the-counter medications. Okay, so it sounds like for pediatrics to really try and use those um, over the counter sparingly and just in general, uh, just not masking symptoms with over the counter and, and making sure that you seek out medical care. Um, would clients, if clients do have uh, symptoms, is it best to contact their neurologist? You mean for COVID symptoms? Mm -hmm. uh, no, well, they need to contact their regular general practitioner or. Okay. 
so they need to call. So there's there's a few options. So generally, you want to contact a general practitioner uh, or your or telehealth or there's a COVID line. Uh, I mean, the, the neurologist will be mostly if you're if you're having seizure related issues or regarding the epilepsy itself, as opposed to um, a, the actual COVID symptoms, because obviously we're not a COVID assessment center and we cannot provide COVID testing. Um, so we would probably just direct you to your general practitioner or telehealth uh, or a COVID um, assessment center. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, the next question is, uh, which epilepsy medications uh, impact the immune system? So um, this is a great question. And um, if you actually go online and Google, you might actually find things that say that there are certain medications uh, that will affect or lower your immunity. And the reality is if you really kind of dig into what this is coming from, a lot of these are sort of in what we call preclinical trials or trials that are not actually in human patients. So a lot of findings are in labs in a Petri dish where they might find that certain epilepsy medications may affect certain parts of the immune, uh, the immune system by studying cells in a Petri dish. Um, that said, there are also what we call case reports or very rare cases where someone's white blood cells, which are the main um, sort of one of main agents of our immunity that, that's used to fight in, in infection might be reduced with um, certain uh, seizure medications. However, um, seizure and epilepsy itself can also modulate your immune system. And I think we can all agree that the risk of untreated seizures or you know, breakthrough seizures by lowering seizure medication doses at this point in time far outweighs these theoretical and rare um, possibility of seizure medications affecting one's immunity. And there really is no compelling evidence um, that seizure medications can predispose someone to getting COVID, for example. And much more important is making sure that they're, that um, everyone's taking their medications as, as directed, is getting adequate sleep, nutrition, and practicing hygiene and other preventive measures. Great, thank you. Um, and finally, one of the general questions that we had was, what uh, vitamins should I or my child be taking? And are there any benefits to be taking vitamins? So this is a great question. Um, in general, especially as we are in a northerly climate, all of us don't get enough sunlight. And especially now with everyone being sort of not really getting as much outdoor time as they normally would, vitamin D would be something that um, is probably a good idea for everyone. Um, in terms of things that could prevent against COVID, there isn't a great deal of evidence. I mean, COVID has really, really been out there for less than half a year, so we don't know enough about it. But in general, um, things that have been shown to um, be protective against respiratory tract infections um, include vitamin C, vitamin D, um, and zinc. Although with zinc, the literature is not, uh, is, is, is not great in terms of recommending a dose. It seems that eating foods that are high in zinc could be just as protective as taking a zinc supplement. But vitamin C and vitamin D are definitely good. And so I would say that, um, again, eating a well-balanced diet, um, taking a vitamin D supplement, and speaking to your pharmacist about what an appropriate dose would be depending on your age, um, would, would be what I would recommend instead of, you know, going out and, and, and purchasing any specific supplement. But those are the three things for which there, there are some evidence for showing that these vitamins could help being, uh, being protective against common respiratory illnesses, not COVID specifically, but respiratory illnesses. Right. So to that, I'm going to add uh, just to expand on the vitamin D. I think the vitamin D uh, story is obviously very important for epilepsy. And I really do a lot of testing for vitamin D levels uh, in my practice because of the fact that um, especially a lot of the old anti-epileptics uh, are vitamin D depleters. We call them enzyme inducer, like uh, phenytoin, uh, carbamazepine, um, and um, uh, phenobarbital, and then some of the ones that are even not enzyme inducers like valproic acid can still deplete vitamin D. And we do know that some of these in long-term studies have shown that they kind of thin the bones. And so I think uh, vitamin D levels as are crucial in taking vitamin D supplements. One thing that we have to be careful about uh, obviously is, is overdoing things. So everything in moderation. Um, so I think that it, sometimes we do test the vitamin D levels. Uh, and that goes back to, again, the question of 
how much care do you want to do during these pandemics? So we want to be able to minimize non-essential blood work, but obviously essential blood work is still needed. Um, and so I think the next time you, you, know, you and so, so the next time you kind of look into talking to a doctor about do you need vitamin D, um, you don't want to overdo it. We've had some patients, unfortunately, take too much vitamin D and they actually can cause problems. So just like taking too much of anything, even vitamin C can cause problems. So I think you have to just, it, you can't just look at a bottle and say, well, if a thousand milligrams is good, then 5,000 milligrams is better, right? So I think you have to be mindful of, of, of looking at that uh, and, and not just make assumptions. Uh, there's a reason why some of these are have numbers and are dosing the way they are. Um, you also have to be mindful of the fact that um, looking at the vitamin D in your, um, in, in your multivitamins, because some people are already taking multivitamins, so that might have a little bit. Um, you also have to be careful of what you see, for example, on a milk package. For example, if a cup of milk on a little uh, carton says 25%, and then you see a, a tablet for 1,000, it doesn't necessarily mean that that means it's, it's 1,000 units in there. So it's 25% of the RDA or recommend daily allowance. So it's not necessarily going to be that high. And so some patients, even if they're drinking a liter of milk, may still need vitamin D. Um, and along with that, I think the other thing is people speak enough calcium. And they say, well, but look, my calcium, magnesium, I take calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, zinc supplements. And you have to be careful when you constantly add things to one pill because sometimes you only add so much. So calcium, magnesium, vitamin D will often have very little amount of vitamin D compared to the calcium. And so I think you have to make sure that you have enough vitamin D on its own, not just the whatever is inside that, that prepackaged pill. And, um, because, and then along with that is that calcium is not enough. So I think people sometimes say, well, I take enough calcium, so I don't need vitamin D, but that's not the same thing. So calcium without the vitamin D, uh, unfortunately, just gets, uh, you just kind of void it out. And so you, you need the vitamin D to reabsorb the calcium into your, into your bones. Uh, and I think that's going to be the important part. So at this point, it's more preventative. Um, and so I think that, again, depends. You can talk to your doctor about whether or not you need vitamin D just during the winter. It depends how much of a summer person you are or how much light you get, sun you get. Uh, but especially if you're on an on a, uh, enzyme-inducing medication, you may need to be on some baseline amounts of vitamin D and then may need to up that during the winter time. So that's, well, you can discuss that with your doctor about that. Great. So it sounds like overall with vitamins, it's really important to be talking with your, um, your healthcare provider uh, and pharmacist to, to make sure that you're not overdoing it um, with vitamins. So I think, well, what we're going to do next is just move into, um, we have a few questions on, um, on our Facebook comments. Uh, and maybe we'll start with a, a question that we got about vitamin D since we're sort of just coming from that. Um, and the question is, uh, this, this individual is a vegetarian and their vitamin D levels are sometimes low. Uh, do you think that they need to take more uh, if they are taking a vitamin um, D uh, supplement per day? Sorry, I wasn't sure who's that supposed to be aimed for. Is that? Um, if it, I mean, either of you can jump in if you if you have a suggestion for this. Individual. I guess uh, that that um, discussion, I guess, uh, aims at whether or not um, the person had a low levels. I don't know how low they were. Um, and I guess that that depends. That's why I said it's important to talk to your doctor. I've seen some patients where I, I do D levels and they're extremely low and sometimes they're only mildly low. So that really depends on that level. So uh, usually the range from the vitamin D is roughly 75 to I think 150 um, and so sometimes it could be 72 or it can be all the way down to 20. And so it depends on the, on, on the amount. Um, and I, meant, I would say that this is also something that your family doctor can deal with. Often vitamin D levels is something that the pediatrician or, vitamin or family doctor can, can manage. Uh, and then if you go to the pharmacist, the pharmacy can help you figure out which ones and, and uh, which brand and, and how to take it. Because sometimes there's drops or tablets. Um, but I mean, some depends if you're taking a thousand, that's generally that the recommended starting dose is to a thousand units. Um, but I mean, whether you need 2000 or 3000 will depend on whether or not uh, the winter months and whether or not the levels are really low. Um, and it may be just saying, let's just test it and see what happens. And uh, if you test it in maybe two or three months, it might go back to normal. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, maybe Laura, um, you can answer this. Uh, so someone has been charged uh, their regular dispensing fee for their usual three month supply. Um, and they were given just 30 days of medication. Um, 
will they have to pay three dispensing fees even if they've already paid the regular yeah question i do have to preface this is that I, I work in the hospital i'm an inpatient hospital pharmacist so i don't actually work um in the in a community pharmacy and i, and I haven't for many many years and so that's uh that's a question that i would actually have to defer to my community colleagues so i can get back to that um uh, the client who asked that question in regards to the specifics about billing. Um, that's not what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I, I'll have to get some more information. Okay, thank you. And we will be sure to, um, to, to put that in the comment section once we do get an answer for that. But thank you so much. Um, so the next question is, would it be helpful for more people to be getting pre-packed medication? I think maybe what they're referring to are what are called compliance packages or blister packages. So this is, um, it, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that is what they're referring to. Uh, maybe we can get back to, maybe that uh, client can, can clarify. Um, in that if, if, for example, if someone is taking seven different medications uh, every day, that perhaps the pharmacy can help them pre-package that into these blister packs or compliance packaging dose sets where, um, you know, instead of that, uh, that patient going and opening seven bottles up to three or four times a day and, and, and doing that and taking out their, their doses to have that prepared ahead of time by the, uh, by the pharmacy so that, you know, come their dose time, they can just pop open, pop open one of these blister packs and take the medication. I think that's what they're referring to. I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, that I, and I think the answer is really it depends. It, it depends on you know how many medications that particular patient is taking, um, because if everyone were to go out and get compliance packaging medications, I, I think it would really kind of overwhelm pharmacies. The pharmacies that these things can be quite um, labor intensive to prepare, and also how stable are their medication doses? A lot of patients might be titrating doses of medications, and if you have a compliance package, it could be very difficult to change or. Um, uh, to change, speed up or slow down your titration. So I think that's, that really depends. I don't think there's kind of a one size fits all um, answer to this, um, but I'm not entirely sure that that's what that question was asking. I'm just kind of um, guessing here. Yeah, um, I mean, I sort of read that question to about uh, also about um, blister packs, which the compliance packs or blister packs are um, really related to um, uh, patients who have difficulties um, counting the pills, taking the pills, uh, especially if they're small tablets, like some tablets are really small and they, and they have difficult, difficulty with, with manual dexterity, so they can't measure it. Sometimes pills come in a very small amount of milligrams and you have to, you need like six or seven of those and that makes it challenging. Uh, so I think that, you know, if someone has a memory problem, a manual dexterity problem, um, they are really forgetful, it's really helpful. Uh, but I agree, it's not just for everyone. I think that it's more challenging. If I'm doing a titration on or off, or if the patient's not on a stable uh, dose, that sometimes makes it difficult because now they've gotten these packages of a, of a week at a time for four weeks. And now what do you do with those medications? Because now I have to either take them out and replace them or something else. So I think it ma makes it more challenging. Um, I think when someone is on a stable dose and they're having, as I mentioned, those, those other difficulties, uh, then the, the compliance pack is good. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, I don't think it's for everybody. I don't, and I think, as you said, is it might overwhelm the, the pharmaceutical, the pharmacy system. So it sounds like that that question was about blister packs so that's great thank you so much um so our our last question that we have currently unless we get some more in um and and dr berkovich i know that you've sort of talked about this uh, already but maybe you can just kind of reiterate um should clients who had appointments with their uh with their neurologist uh, assume that that appointments have been canceled uh, amid COVID, and I guess what is the best way for clients to be connecting with their neurologist neurologist during this time? Right, and uh, I think that goes back to my initial discussion. And thank you for for summarizing that. But um, I think uh, so. I know for us, and I, I can't speak to every neurologist, but for some of my colleagues, and I know myself, uh, we are not canceling appointments. We are moving appointments to virtual. Obviously, it's not the most ideal, and we do ask for patients' consent because this is obviously not the most ideal. But the OMA or the Ontario Medical Association uh, recommends to move to at least during the pandemic to mostly virtual. We do have some patients that come in, but we would not appointments just for the sake of, of a medication refill uh, in a vert like in person but I mean I would I still do most of my appointments um, uh, uh, virtually so uh, I mean it's these obviously unprecedented times and we need to everybody needs to be aware of, of 
the limitations of what we can do, but um, I'm still running uh, full clinics, oh, not full clinics, uh, we're, we're obviously at less than, than full, but, uh, but uh, we're running clinics virtually um, and, um, and still doing appointments. Sometimes we do telemedicine, something called OTN, um, in which case we can do it something like this, like a Zoom chat, but it's through a, 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 a eHealth Ontario secure uh, website um, and uh, we mail a link out and what ends up happening is that um, um, is that then they would open up our chat and we discuss this way uh, they have to obviously have some uh, fast enough internet uh, if they're not computer savvy uh, we have done telephone phone calls and telephone consultations it's obviously more difficult because I, I prefer in person, I prefer, you know, reading body language and facial expressions. I, you know, I miss shaking people's hands. Um, but, you know, the, the challenge, of course, that this is obviously unprecedented time. So what I do now is that we offer telemedicine first. And if they don't or they can't, we'll do telephone appointments. Uh, but we, but I, I would say still treat it like an appointment. So if you have questions, this is your chance. So don't don't say, well, it's just a telephone, just give me my, my prescription, but rather treat it as an appointment. Here are my questions. Here are my concerns. How can we address that as best we can during this appointment? Um, so I think that's kind of what I would do. So don't assume that your appointments are canceled uh, and especially don't assume that you're canceled because of the medication. So I've had some patients say, well, oh yeah, my pharmacy will deal with it. Well, but how will they deal with it? Will they know to contact your doctor? And so you have to make sure that you're on top of your medications and be organized with it uh, and make sure that the, the, doc the pharmacy knows who your doctor is prescribing it and to make sure that you can get it uh, on time. That's a great answer. So really just per, like making sure that you're not just assuming that appointments are canceled just because of COVID um, and, and preparing for these appointments like they would be like a regular appointment. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and so I know that we have talked about this uh, already, but we did get a question in the uh, in the chat and it might be just good to review. Um, so what would be a good recommended time frame for ordering um, during during COVID uh, specifically for for medications? So um, again, no more than 10 days before your next refill date. I would say if you're ordering, if you're, if you're um, calling the pharmacy to get a refill a week, like full seven days before your refill date, I think that's very reasonable. Um, but no, absolutely no more than 10 days. The pharmacy is not allowed to provide more than 10 extra days of medication or 10 days um, earlier than the, the, than, the, than the usual refill date. So that's, that's kind of what I would recommend. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Berkovich, this might be um, a question aimed at, at you. Uh, is there a time frame for when the virtual appointments will end and patients will be able to go in and see their doctor? Um, okay, so that's a very good question. And, and I've sort of alluded to part of that in the beginning that we are not saying no to for patients to come in. I think we're just trying to make sure that only the urgent patients would need to come in. Um, so for, for me, if I have a patient that I really need to have a face-to-face -face discussion with them about something, or if I need to examine them for a reason that they're describing some symptom that I just have to examine them, we will bring them in. We will mask. I will mask. I will mask the patient. We will make sure to take all precautions to minimize the risk of COVID. But really, I mean, uh, and then we screen them. Uh, so we make sure that they haven't had, you know, travel and fever and upper respiratory tract infections, but really we want to make sure that people are, um, uh, that people are, are not, avoiding the doctor for urgent things, right? So we need to make sure that that, that I think everybody out there knows that. Um, and I think that, um, that going back to the question of when this will end, I mean, that's obviously a very difficult question. I don't know when, but let's suppose that they start to open up uh, we'll still have people that are gonna be worried. And I think that in these kind of situation, uh, I would probably say that, um, like for example, if I have a patient who's 75 and their family says, don't, don't leave the house, even though they said you can, but we'll still provide that telemedicine. So just because you know, they we're opening up the, the, the city does not mean, mean that we're gonna stop providing that kind of care for patients who maybe are afraid, or maybe they, they, what if someone does have an upper respiratory tract infection? It could be a regular cold that nobody knows. So we would still try and take those precautions. Um, and if someone says, can I still do a telephone appointment? They would probably say yes. I mean, as long as OHIP still allows it, I mean, that, that will be a different story altogether. Uh, so far, OTN or telemedicine has been there before. I mean, I've been doing OTN since I first started practice. Uh, now, obviously it's much more so. Um, but um, but they will still be tell, OTN will still be allowed, uh, but the telephone follow-ups may not will have a, an end date, but that end date has not been given, so that will still be allowed for some time. Um, and I really think um, 
mean, I really think that this is something that we that uh, that again we 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 want to make sure that we still provide them the care. I think ultimately, um, I think we need to provide that care and not assume that you're you're not going to get the care because of the pandemic. That's great. Thank you so much. I wanted to sort of speak to one other aspect um, about medication changes. Um, I think that we need to obviously be aware. I had this question before about being on medication and all of a sudden uh, want to say, well, I want to change it because of either whatever reason, side effects, pre-pregnancy planning, those kind of things. In some cases, we may want to do a medication change um, uh, for, let's say, being proactive or prof like for something else. Uh, but in some cases, we may want to hold off. So I've had a lot of patients where I would have been changing the medications at this appointment, but because of the pandemic, we're holding off on it. Um, because maybe that medication does have a risk of a rash and we, that may end up happening. They, they may have to go to the hospital for that. So unless it's an urgent, I'm holding off making uh, non-urgent medication changes um, and, and holding off on those things. If it's an urgent, obviously we'll do it uh, with you know very clear guidelines of what to do and, and how to follow uh, what, if there's an urgent need. But um, so that's kind of what I've been practicing in the last, let's say, few weeks with the hope that all of this will end soon and I can start going back to my usual way of practicing. Thank you. Uh, so we did get a, another um, question that's a bit specific, but I'm going to try and generalize it um, a little bit more. But we do uh, you really recommend that if you do have specific questions about your care, that you reach out to your healthcare provider um, because they'll be able to answer uh, specific questions a lot, um, a lot better than we can. Um, so if I have been seizure free for a year and experienced a symptom that's different than than anything I experienced previously, what uh, what should I do? I mean, this is aimed for me. Um, so I, uh, I, I obviously this is very general, um, and uh, I think the challenge is what those symptoms are, uh, because and that's something that obviously uh, you can try and make an appointment, just like you would with your neurologist. Uh, if it's something that you think the family doctor can manage, you might want to reach out to the family doctor first, because again, the sim symptoms are, just because you've had a new symptom does not necessarily mean that it is related to the epilepsy. People who have epilepsy can still get other conditions, and I think. I've, we often get this question where, where someone, as soon as someone knows that they have epilepsy, all the symptoms that they get all of a sudden attributed to that condition. And it's not necessarily true. You can still get other conditions. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that your family doctor is aware. And, and then if they say, no, I think this is related to your epilepsy, then they can uh, go to your neurologist or you can try and make an appointment with both. Uh, but really being able to um, to sort of distinguish what that symptom is versus the regular symptom. So is this just a, a, an aura that's similar to aura or is this completely different? Um, and I know I'm going to go on a limb here, but if someone is having a seizure and all of a sudden they're starting to get chest pains, well, that's obviously, I know these are very general, but I, you know, that's obviously something that's not necessarily for the neurologist, maybe something you need to go to a doctor for uh, like a general, general practitioner, urgent care. Um, so I guess it depends on what those symptoms are and how and and if there's any progression are these you know and the thing that's and I think in this case especially because we're not seeing things I don't like we're not seeing face to face it's really being able to chart as much and I think if, if anything that I, I if you can get out, take anything out of this is really over this time is being much more careful with your charting um, details uh, if you find something that your, you or the person, if your loved one for your for the person with the, with the condition is videotaping an episode, something that you can say here, here's what I've noticed, here's the details of it. Um, the problem is when you don't have those details available and someone's asking, then you have to go back again and, and, and look for those details and come back and just delays things. So I think being able to sort of say, here's what I've found, here's what I, I've noticed, and here's why it's different than the, his other condition or her condition. That's a really uh, important point. And I, I know that uh, we often recommend that um, clients also videotape because um, we know that that can be helpful um, in, in kind of de determining the symptoms as well. Um, okay, well, I think that that is um, all the questions that we have received. So I wanna give a big thank you to Dr. Berkovich and Laura for joining us today and sharing your expertise and time uh, to the community. 
uh, we think it's so important, especially in times like these for the epilepsy community to come together and support one another. So we thank you so, so much. Uh, I also wanna thank all of you at home for joining us today and asking your questions. Uh, this webinar will be uh, able to be viewed on Facebook and YouTube um, after we end the recording today. Uh, and as well, we ask that you join us for our next Facebook Live event happening on May 13th. We will be joined by Theo Sells, a family therapist who will be talking about managing family dynamics during COVID-19. I hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care.